So welcome back to Dwight Inglewood School for those who haven't been back for a while and to our faculty who are here at see some faces. It's good to see you. Um, you know, I, I thought about this. It's reunion weekend, so in my position, I have to run from different activities to different activities. And I was walking up the hall trying to think, how do I start this? And I don't know. I honestly don't know how. For me, I know has meant so much to so many people and obviously a lot to everybody here in this room today. Um, I had the privilege uh, when I arrived to, to be here for a couple years and kind of catch for me at the tail end of her teaching career, if that's the correct way to say it or not. Um, and uh, even in that short period of time, for me to see firsthand the, the, the affect that she had on students. Uh, there was one student we, who was actually one of my favorite early students while I was here. Uh, she was one of our tennis players, Laura Urban, who went, went on to Yale. And uh, Laura Urban and I uh, really talked a lot. We actually played tennis a little bit. And I remember sitting, I can't tell you how many times we sat outside of my office, and she was doing homework for Frimi and reading something for Frimi and the way she would talk about that class. And, uh, and it was as much passion about the literature and the poetry as it was about a passion for Frimi. So for me, the nicest thing that I have I think is this ability to reference this short moment of my time where I had the opportunity to see the students that, um, that, that worked and learned with Frimi and to know Frimi. Um, and then I'll, I'll say one other thing. Frimi and Doris were the first two people 11 years ago who invited me to their house for dinner. Uh, and I was alone. Annette wasn't with me. My family had, had not yet moved up. And it was, I think it was August. And we went and had a dinner. And that was an un unbelievable uh, invitation to the school. And I thought, if the school is like this, I'm, I'm in the right place. Uh, it was just it was a great memory. Uh, so I thank you all for coming. It's a, it'll be nice for a lot of people to share some memories of Fremi. At the end, by the way, we, I am going to open it up for anybody who wants to stand up and, uh, and, and just say a few additional comments to Fremi about Fremi and the relationship with her. If we had one challenge for today, and it has been a very big challenge, it has been trying to, the group of people who've worked on putting this together, how do you narrow down and select a few people who can speak publicly and represent to all of us this Fremi that we know so well, when so many people wanted to be able to do this? It was very, very challenging. So I thank all of you who wanted to, and I, I appreciate your understanding and realizing that not everyone could actually be part of the actual formal program, and at the end, we'll add some time. I would like to make one note, just I think many people I've heard talking are aware of this, but Doris Gelman, of course, you know, Doris and Fermi were the very best of friends. Um, and John, John McCabe, who's in here, I, I, you know, all the videos I saw of them, and I forget what that, the videos were of the Doris and Fermi on the motorcycles. And, and, uh, just unbelievable, but, but Doris uh, it was supposed to be our keynote speaker today. And if I hope I say this, is it Siatica? Is that, it, are going to say that right? Siatica, Siatica, sorry, thank you. She went on a recent trip to Israel, and uh, she, she has this, and she's really kind of been a little bit of uncomfortableness, to, to say the least. So she wasn't able to travel here from her home in Massachusetts. Uh, so we miss you all, Doris. Uh, but. Uh, Marcia Strongwater has, uh, is going to read something that Doris wrote, which will be a pleasure. Uh, it will be my job today just to sort of introduce everybody as we go through it. So the first I'd really like to do, very, very proud to introduce Susanna Sagan from the class of 77 to uh, do her reflection. And thank you, Susanna. So um, throughout my time at Dwight Englewood, many, many students would come up to me and say, it must be so wonderful to be Mrs. Sagan's daughter. You're so lucky. <laughs> of course, these other students didn't realize Mrs. Sagan wasn't the same at home. She cared about a curfew, didn't like finding me kissing people in the corridor, and when I got a C, didn't go so well. Fortunately, though, I've passed out of those dreaded teenage years and am now able to say unequivocally, yes, it was really wonderful being Mrs. Sagan's daughter. Her love of all things literary, from the authors to the books themselves, created a wonderful world to be in. And when she actually got a job teaching her passion, <laughs> that world really changed. In this school, Mrs. Sagan was at her best. She loved everything about the school. She loved the students, especially those that took AP English or Russian Lit. She loved the ninth graders just starting out in their intellectual journeys. 
She liked the talk to teens and couldn't believe how challenging young people's lives were. She loved her independent studies, all 136 of them, and she loved her reading group, all 720 of them. She also loved her classroom. I can remember visiting when I was young and couldn't believe how beautiful it was, filled with posters, knickknacks, quotes, a real jumble of ideas. This, of course, was in deep contrast to my own home, which was always perfectly decorated and neat and tidy. My mom loved both spaces and especially enjoyed when the worlds collided. <coughs> Students came to the house for a special reading of Macbeth, where the entire English department came for the most elegant potluck dinners I've ever seen. Of course, there were also those stressful late, very late nights, when she helped students put out the next issue of Calliope. I don't know anyone else who had a light table on their dining room table. <laughs> My mother also loved the faculty study. Over the years, people tried to move her desk or even move her out of the room. <laughs> Needless to say, they failed. My mother had her perfect spot surrounded by her treasures, and nothing was going to get her to change it. Part of what made it perfect was that the room was filled with such a wonderful mix of faculty. This school gave my mother an incredibly rich social life, from the first-year teachers who nervously asked advice to her posse of iconic ladies. My mother found the deepest connections with so many people, whether they were comparing notes about teaching or sharing personal stories or simply talking about navigating teenagers who not only lived with them but roamed the halls as well. Now, I don't want to mislead and give the impression that everything was perfect at Dwight Englewood. My mother hated meetings. <laughs> she found them unnecessary and a complete waste of time. She felt they brought out the worst in people, and there was so much else she could be doing instead of wasting time at school-wide or English department meetings. I once asked what were these other things that she could be doing, and she said, going to the garden store, buying geranium, <laughs> Let me also be clear, my mother wasn't 100% successful in her teaching. I still owe her a Heart of Darkness paper. <laughs> <laughs> and my eldest son never took an English lit class in college. But generally speaking, everyone she touched found a new appreciation for reading, understanding, and looking at the world. My father always said that my mother was the world's greatest audience, and she was. I've been thinking very hard on how this connected to her amazing ability to be a teacher, someone who's usually the star and not the audience. I think the real trick is that my mother not only cared about what she had to say, she genuinely cared about what everyone else had to say. She was delighted with a new thought, amazed when someone finally caught the point, and experienced such joy when those around her loved what she loved. I'm currently in the process of downsizing, and so I'm reviewing all of my memory stuff. I found long letters she sent to me at camp, short notes celebrating the release of Harry Potter 7, and many notes from others about my mom. It's been lovely to relive her life through these different lenses. I had no idea she sat on the 1989 Centennial Committee, nor that she liked to play the part of Rosalind and As You Like It, or that she chaired the summer grants when it was first developed. I do know she would be very pleased to know that the funds that we're raising in her memory are now going to support these same summer faculty grants. I have always known that my mother had the highest standards. In fact, in my little family, we referred to things as FA, Premier Approved, and of course there is the NFA, but we won't go there. <laughs> I recently found a quote of hers that said, it's important to explore different teaching styles, but of course you must remain focused on the major authors. <laughs> This is what she did and taught us all around her to value. In conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone who helped put today together. This is truly a wonderful moment. And although we never discussed it directly, my mom knew that we would all come together at the school that she loved to celebrate her life. Ultimately, this school was my mom's village. She brought so many people into it and felt so lucky to have been invited into it herself. Next, I'd like to introduce, I think, two members of the posse, if we could say that. Uh, I know two women, by the way, who uh, looked up to Frimi tremendously. And I think when Frimi left, 
I think there was a hole to fill that you always struggle to fill as part of those women. But uh, Diane Christensen and Joan Mathetone from the English faculty. It is our great honor to speak about our dear friend, Fermi Sagan, this afternoon. It's so easy because there are so many memories that we can share, but it's also so difficult because the memories are so full and seemingly without number. Diane and I, now the senior women in the department, <laughs> would like to describe to you the Fermi that we knew as younger women finding our way. I think that if we could honor Fermi and the role she played in our lives by imparting her wisdom and love to the younger women now in the department, we will be very pleased and very gratified. I cast about thinking, trying to think of what for me meant to me, and realized that the ideal term would be a version of the commonly used expression work wife or work husband, that person who's emotionally supportive and helpful in the work world. Well, I thought, yes, I'll coin the word work mother for the purpose of this speech, only to realize, with a quick Googling, that this term already exists. <laughs> oh well, although the term is not mine, it absolutely suits for me. She was my work mother. I came to DE from years in public school, uh, public school teaching, and found independent school to be a bit daunting. I first met for me in the group interview, something I feel was and is a throwback to the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> I was so intimidated by Nancy Melser's thoughtful and incisive literary questions, Sam Bacon's pedagogical challenges, <laughs> and even Ellie Fayer's harem pants, something I had never seen in public school, ever. <laughs> Quietly present in the group was Frimmy, a woman with white hair and the most angelic smile. Her questions and supportive comments put me at ease. In my mind, she became my work mother then and there. Throughout our years together, Fermi and I shared so many experiences. <clears throat> we took part in the March for Women's Equality in Washington in 1989, and a picture of our little group of students and teachers is on my bookshelf in faculty study. I cherish it. My work mother was always there for me as I navigated the very different waters of an independent school. At one point, she patiently tolerated the coup that Peter Platt and I were staging to remove Hamlet from the American literature curriculum. <laughs> Not surprisingly, we lost, as Hermie felt that a DE education should provide for a study of Shakespeare every year. Hermie was also a wonderful source of child-raising advice. She and I would have dates for tea. We would swap news of our families, and she would share her thoughts on raising my daughter, Catherine. We would always agree that while we love teaching, we absolutely love parenting more. That was for me, my work mother, always sensing when I needed her and always there to give me just enough help to allow me to figure out life on my own. When Fermi was planning to retire, she asked me to head the summer grant committee, which was one of her favorite activities. It was a joy working with Fermi that first year, and seven years later, it remains a pleasure to encourage the learning of my peers through the generous support of the school. When I look back on her notes in that lovely little cursive, always in black ink, I smile. I think that maybe my work mother would smile too, to see that I'm doing my best to keep the program vital. It is so fitting that this program will be renamed in her honor. Yes, Fermi and I agreed that we enjoyed the best aspects of a mother and daughter relationship, as we never had to tussle over homework, or haircuts, or boyfriends, or missed curfews. Fermi dear, and I say that because I was always Joan dear to her, helped me to grow as a teacher and as a mother, for which I am eternally grateful. In a note that I received after her retirement, Fermi referred to me as her unofficial daughter. I can think of no higher praise. I have been extremely fortunate in my life to have wonderful people cross my path, and I am forever grateful. One of those people was Fermi Sagan. I admired Fermi and considered her both a colleague and a friend, and although she is no longer with us, I want to thank her for the many gifts 
she gave me. I want to thank her for always greeting me with a smile and a sweet word. I want to thank her for her sage advice about teaching when I was just a newbie here at Dwight Englewood. I still have her notes on the Odyssey in cursive, handwriting, and black ink. <laughs> I want to thank her for including me in a somewhat exclusive little group of four that met at her house for tea about once a month for almost a year. Those tea parties were filled with gems of information about books, old and new, about music, her piano playing, about politics and about our individual lives. I love drinking tea from dainty china cups and eating cookies placed on small trays. Thank you, for me. I also want to thank her for agreeing to guide me through the reading of Crime and Punishment. We would meet, talk a little about the book, but more about Russian literature in general. We were not always good at staying on task. There's too much other stuff to talk about. I want to thank her for the small bureau that I use every day. She gave it to me as she was preparing to move north. I also want to thank Remy for our very serious talks about fashion. I found out about Chico's from her. <laughs> and about perfume, she admired my passion for smelling good. Lastly, I want to say thank you, Frimala. She allowed me to call her Frimala. For all that she meant to me, for all that she gave me, and for that wonderful twinkle in her eyes, signaling, who knows, <laughs> but always something special. It was a privilege for me and Joan to be able to talk about what for me meant to us. We shared stories and memories of our time with her, and we shall never forget. By the way, Savannah, we still hear them talk about Frimmy all the time, which is really a treat. Um, next, I'd like to welcome uh, Martha Strongwater, who I think, if I had this right, she, you're going to read a reflection of yours, right? Welcome back, Martha. Thank you. 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 It's a rare honor to speak on behalf of my dear friend Doris Gelman about our beloved Frimmy. These remarkable women played a profound role in shaping my personal and professional life for 40 years. Doris. It was more than 50 years ago. Use the mic. Is the mic on? Yeah. I'm sorry. It was more than 50, 50 years ago. Yes, we are speaking in half centuries. Lyndon Johnson was president. That Fermi Sagan called and asked me to meet her for lunch at the then Raskella restaurant on English Street. She had heard that I was teaching at the Dwight School for Girls, and she wanted to know if I would recommend teaching to her. We learned that within a year or so, our lives had followed somewhat similar trajectories. A bachelor's degree, a master's degree, marriage, a house in Inglewood, four children, three girls and a boy each, and an urge to return to the classroom. It was a long, long lunch, and the conversation continued for more than 50 years. I speak today as Frimi's friend, colleague, and student. For four years, we taught together an interdisciplinary class in American history and American literature. I sat every day in Frimmy's American Literature class, and she in my American History class. We both cherished that experience. And so, I believe, did the students. I teased Frimmy that if I let her teach a history class, no matter the subject, it would always begin, once upon a time, <laughs> there was a bad king. <laughs> But she actually once let me teach a Hemingway short story. Planning for this course revealed the many dimensions of Frimmy's life at Dwight Inglewood. First, her admonition to every colleague that teachers, like doctors, should take an oath to do no harm. We had a weekly appointment, but finding time together was often a challenge. 
Primi had an independent study with a student, with two students, with three students. Another student wanted her to look at a short story she had written. Primi was reading poetry with a colleague. She was reading Joyce with another colleague. A troubled student needed to see her. A troubled colleague wanted to see her. A former student wanted to say hello. And then there was Calliope for several years. I had to get in line. <laughs> Whatever text I studied with Frimmy, I owned in a totally different way and forever. I leave it to Frimmy's colleagues who teach literature to explain the brilliance of her teaching. But I do have my own theory. <coughs> One of her favorite adjectives was intense. She applied it to a range of subjects, something of great beauty, a discussion, a particular accomplishment, a performance, a dispute. And though Frimmy moved and spoke with a certain serenity, she was really a person of many passions that she experienced all of these and more intensely. Of these, literature is a given, but a passion also for dance, for music, for Eli, for Carvel, for babies everywhere, for decency, for justice, for Miriam, for drawing, for gardens, for piano, for Andrew Jackson, for Susanna, for feminism, for education, for architecture, for Dan, for Vogue magazine, for Russian lit, for Rachel, for friendship, for Boston, for courtesy, for teaching. Frimmy brought all of these passion, passions to the classroom in one way or another. The everyday experience blended with the more intellectual in her own gifted magical formula. A few months ago, more perhaps, it seemed so immediate when Frimmy had stopped reading books and the gorgeous art books no longer held her interest. On an impulse, I brought to one of our regular visits a sheaf of poems from a poetry class I had just finished. I started to read a favorite of mine to her. Very quickly, a loud voice was heard. Give me those poems. <laughs> and for three hours, she read without a pause, as only she could read. Her lovely voice, lifting each poem from the page, caressing it a little, adding her own intensity. It was already dark outside. We both sensed that something astonishing had happened. We embraced one another, and I left her home silently. Many of you in this room have experienced what I call the golden safety net of Frimmy's friendship. You will recognize, I know, that she responded immediately to any call, any emergency, any crisis with her full attention, which included long talks, food, small gifts, larger gifts, and more long talks. She was a wonderful listener, and she always offered a new way to look at any problem. How wonderful that for these last five or six years, Frimmy and I should find ourselves in the Boston area. The conversation continued. Children, grandchildren, late husbands, politics, literature, friends, and of course, the Dwight Englewood School. Thank you, Marsha. You could not have done that better. Thank you, Doris. Um, one of my early memories was I, I played the piano from, I think my mother started making me play the piano when I was maybe eight. I have no idea. But I took formal piano lessons, so I was 32. And then I stopped. I got married and I stopped. And then I came here, I think, when I was maybe 52 or something like that, and bumped into Frimmy Sagan, who was still taking piano lessons. And it always amazed me that it was weekend. I never, I always wanted to hear her play. 
Um, and the next person who, instead of speaking, is going to play is probably one of Fermi's greatest fans. And I am really excited personally because Armand Pohan, in many much the same way, has been doing the same. And uh, Armand, I've been very excited to hear you play for many years. And uh, I think we all look forward to it. I know Fermi would really, really appreciate this. So Armand, who is playing Franz Schubert in Prompt 2, 899, number three in G flat. Actually, before I, before, I, before, I, before I speak, because I speak better than I play, um, I just want to make a few remarks about Fermi. Um, I first met Fermi in the headmaster's office. It was Halloween 1985, and she was wearing a kimono. <laughs> you should come to my senior class next week, she, Fermi said. We're starting Othello. I told her that I had once taught Othello. Good, she said. We'll teach it together. <clears throat> So I went to her class Monday morning, and we taught together for two weeks, including a full reading of the play in her home. It was the start of a beautiful friendship. Armin, my dear, you must come to our reading group, Fermi said. And so for the next 27 years, I attended the reading group, faithfully. Books were our first bond, although we did not always agree about books. We argued about Jane Austen and Henry James, she accused me of being pro-management. <laughs> I teased her of not understanding the dark side, which would drive her crazy. But soon we found we had another bond, one about which we never disagreed, and that was music. Mozart, Schubert, Schubert Schumann, Chopin, Brahms, we loved them all. And we also played them all on the piano. To be sure, we were not professionals. We were enthusiastic amateurs, whose reach usually exceeded our grasp. But we played duets together for our own pleasure and for others. The Brahms waltzes, the Dvorak Slavonic dances, the great fantasy in F of Schubert. It was great fun. We played pretty well for amateurs, but if our heads began to swell, a coaching session with Fermi's teacher, Elizabeth Rich, would quickly bring us back to earth. <laughs> After one such humiliation, we recalled to each other the opening of the importance of being earnest. The butler Lane is arranging afternoon tea. The sound of a piano is heard in the background. Algernon enters. Algernon, did you hear what I was playing, Lane? Lane, I didn't think polite to listen, sir. <laughs> Algernon, I'm sorry for that for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. <laughs> Well, we did play with wonderful expression and enthusiasm. I miss playing with Fermi. I miss conversing with Fermi. I miss her insight. I miss her inclusiveness. I miss her passion for the abrasive and healing powers of art. You enrich my life, Fermi, and the lives of so many of us here, including my daughters. And so, my dear friend, from one amateur to another, this Schubert is for you.
beautiful, Aaron. It's truly beautiful. <laughs> My pleasure to welcome back from the class of 2006, Ramona Denny, to say a few words. Um, it's a real honor to be here today to say some words about Ms. Sagan. Um, it would be almost impossible for me to overstate um, the profound impact that Ms. Sagan had on my life. Most obviously, I'm an English teacher, uh, in large part because of her. Um, but equally important, though maybe less readily apparent, is that I think and read the way I do in large part because of her. She was my teacher, but also my mentor, my friend, and advisor, like a grandmother, and also a great hero of mine. I had the great privilege of first meeting Ms. Sagan when I was a ninth grader at DE. I vividly remember coming into her classroom on the first day of school, and just knowing immediately that learning with her would be a life-changing experience. It was impossible to not know, meeting her on that first day, that all of us as students were going to have a teacher unlike any we'd had before. And for that whole year, as Ms. Sagan read to us in her beautiful reading voice, her voice that I will never forget, and guided us through works that one might not intuitively categorize as page turners for ninth graders, um, Homer, Dickens, Keats, Tennyson, Chekhov, Rilke, we were riveted. Yes, by the literature, but most of all, we were just riveted by Ms. Sagan, by anything she said or did um, would leave us spellbound. Because along with teaching us how to read and write, which she did expertly, of course, she also taught us how to live. Using herself as the primary example, she showed us that literature is not just a thing to be passively consumed, but instead a vital and active medium for examining one's purposes in life and for understanding each other and for improving ourselves as human beings. Um, Ms. Sagan and I became very close during that first year of high school. Like so many others in this room today, I became and remain a complete Ms. Sagan devotee. Mm -hmm. And in the years that followed, we became even closer. Every Friday morning for three, the three years that followed, she met privately with our friend Emma and me for an independent study on fiction writing. And as always, that line between our academic study and the greater world would dissolve in the best possible way during those hours. After all, if the purpose of literature is to understand life, then how can one examine stories or art of any kind without active consideration of one's real life? And so through these meetings, I had the privilege of getting to know Ms. Sagan as a full person, and she got to know Emma and me too. We learned about her enormous love and pride for her family, for her children, her grandchildren, and Eli, and we relished the stories she generously shared with us about their gatherings and conversations, all of which would leave me secretly wishing that I could be her grandchild too. <laughs> um, we also heard about her devotion to her many book clubs, which even included a Latin translation club. And finally, um, maybe in as a way to connect with our ongoing efforts to improve as writers, she would recount the many hours she had spent practicing piano under the fierce tutelage of her teacher, Elizabeth. Um, no matter the subject, though, Ms. Sagan's stories shared a common thread. Her identity as a constant, lifelong learner who adored seeking out new opportunities to get shaped and reshaped, to see things from a new angle or lens, no matter how wise she became. I'm sure I speak for many in this room when I say that it's been incredibly painful and challenging to fully accept that Ms. Sagan has passed on, and in recent months, I've tried to seek comfort in the literature and art that she shared with us all. Um, I have reread poems or scenes from novels and conjured her gentle reading voice in my head, and doing this helps me feel a little closer to her. Luckily, Ms. Sagan was so generous and also so specific in sharing what she loved that we needn't look too far. We can reread that scene in the Odyssey when Argos recognizes Odysseus. She loved that moment. Or the scene in Great Expectations when Joe fumbles with his hat. And those are just two examples I remember. Soon after her passing, I took the book Ms. Sagan gave me for high school graduation off my bookshelf, which was the collected works of Rilke. I want to end today by sharing with you a short Rilke poem I know she loved, Archaic Torso of Apollo. Ms. Sagan first shared this with us as ninth graders, but she referenced it many times throughout high school. I recall that she loved this poem for two key reasons. First, because of how well it describes the power that she believed all, art, all great art possesses. And second, and maybe more importantly, because of how it articulates the responsibility of the perceiver to treat all art as a call to action, as a reason to interrogate one's purpose. And the poem ends with the directive, you must change your life. 
And I believe that this is an idea Miss Sagan took literally. She was always on a quest to change her life, to know, to see, and feel more, to take more in. And in so doing, she taught everyone who was lucky enough to encounter her and build a relationship with her to hold on to these words too. Don't lose sight of who you are. Never forget what you love or what matters to you most. And in my lifelong quest to emulate Miss Sagan as best I can, I try to live life and read books with those words in mind too. Um, so archaic torso of Apollo. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes ripening, with eyes like ripening fruit. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem to face beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur. Would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Um, I love you so much, Miss Sagan, and we thank you for everything today. Great to hear that her life is living out through you, but also to your students, I'm sure. We'll go a couple generations earlier uh, to Mark Shapiro, class of 77. What a crowd. What a life. What a legacy. I mean, I've been listening to this. I'm sure we all have, and you think it's extraordinary. And as I've been thinking about sort of what I plan to say and then listening to what other people said, you can hear the, the themes that are there the extraordinary energy of the life, and I'm thinking it is very hard to find the way in because there are so many possible ways to start the conversation. However, I was very fortunate, one of those serendipitous things, uh, it is spring, and like many of us who live in small New York apartments, was trying to do some spring cleaning. And I was uh, fumbling around in one of the few closets I have, and look what I found. So, this is Calliope, for those who don't see it, from 1977, January 1977. So the particular um, special aspect of this magazine was that um, I was the editor with somebody, co-editor, and of course for me was our advisor, faculty advisor. So it has been really something coming across this poetry and thinking about how this experience of editing this magazine under Fermi's guidance, really shaped a lot of what I now do in the world. Um, some of you know that I'm a conductor and I do a lot of programming and things like that, and I think what has given me the most joy in my own professional work is the curatorial aspect of it, of making, finding other great work and setting it up so that other people could appreciate it and understand it. I look on my own poetry in this with complete mortification. Um, <laughs> And by the way, if anybody here is thinking of running for office, I do have your adolescent poetry in my hand. Um, including, and I just can't resist it, a line of Susanna Sagan's. So I'm going to have to just read the first line. Do you remember it? So did I, which was amazing. So I, I won't do the whole thing because who knows how Susanna feels about this now. But um, the poem is called Silver. And it begins thus. I was drowned in moonlight. No, it wasn't murder. I was with myself. <laughs> there are others. Uh, I think Jean Kuzmiak is here. Um, so I saw... Uh, where's Jean? Yeah, hi. Do you remember this poem? No, but please don't. <laughs> So I'll read you just the first line, okay? Uh, wait a second, let me find it. It's page 26. Yeah. A philosopher's life work. Does it ring any bells? No. Okay. <laughs> a stack of paper one mile high, every sheet with a thought written on it, lit at the top. Ah, okay. So the experience of working on this with Frimi, I remember being at her house, which uh, Suzanne, I think, described. It was an amazing experience. And one of the themes that I've been hearing today 
is the, the whole feeling of collaboration, interdisciplinary. I talked to my sister this week, who was um, four years before me at Dwight, and I said, you know, I'm going to be at Dwight on Saturday talking about Fermi, what do you remember? And she thought for a minute, and she said, an interdisciplinary class. So I guess this would have been in the early 70s, and with uh, Rebecca Blackwell and Dick Fayer, uh, she described to me a class that integrated English, history, and classics, or Latin. And what is it, a hundred years later, she still remembers that experience and that class. And th this whole thing, you know, we, we've hear, heard this cliche so much about it takes a village. I don't remember for me ever saying something like that. I don't think of her as a particularly preachy person, but boy, did she live it. You can really hear in this room that she created collaboration and interaction everywhere she went. It's really, it's extraordinary. And one of the things that I remember from Dwight, I was thinking it's very hard to talk only about for me because every, the, what Susanna called that posse was so astonishing. There was one year in particular where I don't remember how it came about, but the English teachers were all invited to teach the thing that they cherished. And uh, Frimmy taught Russian literature, and Ellie Fayer taught Irish literature, and Jean Wojtyla taught Faulkner. And it was, I think it was the best educational experience of my life wow. that year. It, I, I went to college, graduate school, nothing even close. Um, I think people have talked about that. There are two memories I want to share from the Russian literature class. One is a name that no one has mentioned today, but I think was very dear to Frimmy, which is Isaac Babel. Um, a short story writer who, whose stories were kind of suppressed and who reemerged. Fermi was a real champion of his, and that was, if had it not been for Fermi, I would not know about him. Uh, I'll get to one other reminiscence in a moment, but an another thing about what Fermi was about, and I think the whole school was about, we're so focused, I, I also have a sort of day job in academia now, on the kind of utilitarian aspect of anything you might do uh, if it's sort of learning a language or reading a book, that there has to be some purpose, some reason that you would do it. And I vividly know that for Fermi that was never even on her mind, as you would have to defend why you would read literature and study Shakespeare and think about it. Um, it was so much, it's just worth doing. It's just worth doing, just what you said. And uh, uh, so, so I think Suzanne also mentioned the Shakespeare Club. One of my fond memories was, and I think it's Macbeth, I don't remember this line, but I was thinking about another thing I loved about Fermi was her voice. People have talked about it a little bit. She had such a musical speaking voice, the cadences and this kind of, I don't know if contralto exactly, but something low and beautiful. Um, and I remember being, we did uh, these readings of Shakespeare out loud where everybody would take various parts. And I think I remember who it was, but I won't say it, but there was, there's the line, and I think it's Macbeth, of go get him surgeons. Does that ring a bell with anybody? But at the, when we did the uh, reading, somebody read it, go get him surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Fermi's uh, expression. <laughs> um, so, I, I remember the feeling of, I went back actually to look at Fermi's classroom today, and just that, I, it again came to me that I always looked forward to walking into that room for its beauty and also just the experience that you knew you were going to have, of the kind of conversation you were going to have, the way Fermi did in, indeed, as people have been saying, elicit what everybody was thinking so that you would have conversations with each other. I think she was in a way way ahead of her time in thinking about teaching in the classroom in that way. So I want to finish with one um, very fond memory, which is a little bit of a naughty memory. So uh, for me was, as we said, very interdisciplinary, and she loved music. She really did love music. I do remember that about her very much. Uh, and she wanted to, to make these connections, and we were in the Russian literature class. I think it was for Anna Karenina. And she decided that she would give her speech, or ta her talking about Anna Karenina, um, with music in the background. And she picked the March Slav of Tchaikovsky. So people who know the piece, it starts kind of softly, and it builds to a really deafening crescendo. So in that day, in those days, people had LPs. So 
uh, Fermi put the record on the record player and started speaking. And the music got louder and louder and louder. And within about five minutes, she was sort of screaming at us. <laughs> It, we were all giggling. It was a very, it's a very fond memory, but for me, a very vivid memory of also, for, well, I think what people have described as Fermi's kind of strength of character, that she was not going to let Tchaikovsky's March Slav <laughs> interfere with what she wanted to say. So she was a truly wonderful teacher among many other wonderful teachers at a wonderful place, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about him. Next is Fred Daly, who's the chair of the English department, who I'll just say before Fred comes up here, because I've had the opportunity for 11 years to really know Fred well. Um, I know that few people probably, for me, has affected more than Fred in his teaching, his thinking, his love for literature, and pretty much everything that Fred does. So Fred, please. Thank you for stealing my speech, Rodney. <laughs> Actually, uh, I feel like my speech has already been given. You'll see. You'll see. Um, so here we go. This is the speech. Dear Fred, it sounds like I'm starting a letter to myself, doesn't it? But actually, I'm quoting Frimmy. That's what she called me. And as you've heard, uh, I'm not the only person she called dear. But you know she meant it every time for every one of us. As, as chair, I, I wonder if I should be talking about Fermi's intellectual prowess and her masterful teaching. I was going to say pedagogy, but I don't believe, I believe I ever heard Fermi utter that word. Uh, I will say something about that part in a minute, but I want to start with Fermi the person. Uh, and uh, let me start with a story. Early in my acquaintance with Fermi, we had a meeting of the faculty on a Thursday morning in the second week of school. The date was September 13th, 2001. We were meeting because we hadn't had school the day before, because the day before that, our country had been attacked. The faculty met first, before the students arrived, to share our own feelings and also to talk about how to help our students navigate what felt like a totally different world. I remember two colleagues got into a testy debate about the meaning of the attacks. These were two people who didn't mind voicing their opinions and didn't like each other much, and things were on the verge of getting really bad. And Frimmy raised her hand and said, I think we should all be kind to one another today. And that was it. They stopped. These were two people who never stopped, and they stopped. Nobody else could have done that but Frimmy. It was a magical moment, and it has stayed with me. I think about that moment all the time. Uh, I lived in Manhattan in those days, and for a few weeks, Manhattan became a kinder place. It was nice. Uh, for a little while there, we were living in Frimmy's world, and I think sometimes how living in Frimmy's world can make you a better person. Frimmy's world included a wonderful spirit of generosity with colleagues and students. She had her classes, she had the book group, and she had the long list of independent studies with the long list of students, the Iliad, Rome, Russian literature, poetry, you name it. Uh, when she retired, I cheekily asked for me for a present. I should have been giving her a present, but I wanted her to give me one. <laughs> I asked for a one session independent study on T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And so, in one of the most pleasant and intellectually stimulating hours I've ever known, we studied this notorious, difficult text. Uh, Fermi had an edition of the poem that included facsimiles of early drafts with Eliot's own annotations and also feedback from Ezra Pound. At one point, Pound crossed out an entire page of Eliot's poetry, and that page is not in the poem as we know it now. At another point, Pound wrote in the margin, this is good, I think. <laughs> uh, that hour, is a gift I will always treasure, and it's the same gift Fermi gave to so many students and colleagues, that she could help us understand and make us want to understand the most challenging works of literature. Um, I want to close by talking about somebody else for a, mo for a moment. Uh, she's not here, but she's on her way. 
Her name is Noah Levine, and she will be graduating tomorrow. Noah is this year's recipient of the Trimmy Sagan Award for Excellence in English. She's not here because she had a piano recital at one o'clock in Nyack. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> a piano recital. The Trimmy Sagan Award winner plays the piano. And that's not the only thing they have in common. Uh, in remembering Frimmy, we think of her love of literature, her love for people. In giving the award, we in the department ask ourselves every year, who best captures the spirit um, of intellectual commitment and generosity and love that Frimmy brought to this campus every day? This year, that's Noah. And I'm glad she'll be here soon, because I want those of you who don't know her to meet her. And you'll see right away what I mean. Uh, when we did the awards the other night, I said to Noah, Frimmy would have loved you. I can practically hear Frimmy's voice with her New England accent that I loved so much, talking about this child and, and calling her Dear Noah. Um, on an occasion like this, we look back, but, but ours is really a forward-looking profession. We help young people prepare for, prepare for their futures, which uh, Mark alluded to this a minute ago, which doesn't just mean what kinds of jobs they're going to do, but what kinds of people they're going to be. Someone like Noah, whose personal and intellectual qualities so marvelously embody Fermi's legacy. Someone like Ramona. Someone like Lauren Urbant, who couldn't be here because she's in London, and who came to my office and cried when she learned Mrs. Sagan was retired. And I could keep going. The magic of Fermi Sagan has touched so many of us. And through us will touch the lives of countless young people Fermi never knew. And so I just want to close by saying for myself and for my current students and for my daughter, who's a freshman here this year, thank you for me. Thank you. And while we're doing so, it, it is interesting to hear people talk. Uh, Frimi's name is now attached to three places. It's an English award. It's the summer grants, all of which both mean so much, and it's the name of a room. And I wonder sometimes how much of that is selfish. I've always thought we name rooms after people because we don't want their names to go away. And it's fun to say to students, oh, you have this, you're going to be in the Sagan room. And I think that's just our way of always wanting to say Sagan. Uh, but I do think the summer grants and the English award truly do honor all that she stood for in the school. And I hope that we can live up to those awards and those summer grants into the future, and well into the future. So uh, Annie Sagan, class of 82. Annie. Um, and thank you to everybody who helped organize this event and everybody who's managed to come and speak so beautifully about my mother. Um, I prepared some remarks, but given what some people have said today, I have to improvise a little bit before I start. Um, I, uh, I'm the youngest of Fermi's children, and I had the privilege that my sisters did not have, which I lived alone with Fermi uh, for uh, many of the months that my dad was teaching in California. So we had the house to ourselves. After being at her classroom in the morning, I would have to spend the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the arts editor for Calliope that year, and I got to stay up at the light table after Fermi went to sleep. <laughs> and I think that's why I do what I do today. Um, not by choice, but by a sense of obligation. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be standing in front of a banner that says, Per Ardua Ad Veritatem. Um, it's ironic, I don't think 35 years ago I even knew that the school had a motto. Uh, but given what I've written about for me, it's appropriate. And I too, uh, Ramona, I've uh, referenced the real poem as well. And uh, you're in the context in which you said that I realized that Frimi was also a great teacher of teachers. Um, in my own teaching, I have to channel her some days. Um, and one thing that people didn't mention is that there were, stu there were teachers here, young teachers who came to the school here who were particularly assigned to Frimi to be their mentors. Some of those teachers um, became my teachers. And uh, that was a great gift, a sort of trans-lineage transmission, if you will. So here goes what I prepared. 
So Fermi was a woman of letters, a woman of ideas. She led a life that included family, friends, colleagues, and work. Being married to my father, Eli Sagan, she led the life of a private intellectual. With Eli, she discussed countless ideas for countless hours. But Frimi did not channel her intellectual energies into writing, and as a result, everyone here benefited from the fact that she channeled that tremendous energy into her teaching. Frimi was a great teacher in part because she was a great lover of the ideas embodied in the books that she taught. And she loved the books themselves. She carried herself knowing that the books she loved were real. She would intone their names with a reverence that made you wonder what it was she was connecting to. <coughs> the Tempest, The Wasteland, The Colossus, The Brothers Karamazov. She would say these titles, and then by association, we were to be in awe of them. Because at her core, she saw in these texts great power. Fermi was a great teacher because she wanted to share the power of these works of art with everyone. Excuse me. Also a little bit allergies, but uh, yes, I'm feeling it. Whether a fellow colleague, a student, or a friend, even my friends as we were growing up, no one was free from her demands that we take on these works as a challenge, that we not see them as something to read and enjoy, but that we understand them to be vessels of meaning. Fermi was a great teacher because she believed anyone could be a reader of great literature. It was only a matter of effort. Fermi loved hard work. Her own parents instilled in her a work ethic, which she in turn passed on. But she was convinced that any of her students could take on the task of grappling with T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, <coughs> Gogol, or Dostoevsky. In fact, she would describe it not as reading crime and punishment, but working through crime and punishment. <laughs> Fermi carried this ethic into her love of music, where she would talk about working through a Beethoven sonata <coughs> or a Brahms waltz. In this regard, Fermi saw that understanding great art is like a journey. A journey where you come out the other side a different person with a new understanding of the world. Her invitation to her students was simple. All she asked was that they be profoundly transformed by the works of literature that she loved. In some sense, two of Fermi's favorite poems hold in their last lines the ethic which guided her throughout her journey here at Dwight Inglewood. I'm speaking of a poem by Keats and one by Rilke. Keats's ode to a Grecian urn and Rilke's archaic torso of Apollo are both deeply rooted in the humanist traditions which Fermi carried on through her teachings. They both involve protagonists whose connection to time and the universe are balanced through the fulcrum of an ancient work of art. And they both come forth with the conviction that great art must be seen as a catalyst for understanding the world. At the end of the Rilke poem, he simply says, you must change your life. And I can hear Fermi saying that at the end of a good study of King Lear, right? She sort of nod her head and say, well, now you must all change your life. In conclusion, I would like to read the last stanza of Keats's poem, because it makes sense given the present circumstances. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou solid, silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth.
truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. I have to start with two disclaimers. Um, one is that I think I'm a frimmy neophyte. Uh, I didn't meet her until she was in her late 70s, I gather. Um, and so many of you know her much, much better and for much, much longer than, than I did. Um, the second one is that she always felt sorry for me because I taught science in my earlier career. <laughs> and as you'll see, she tried to, she tried to fix me as, as best she could. <laughs> Listening to these stories about Fermi touches a place deep in my heart. From the minute we first met, not knowing much about her, it was clear that she was someone special and someone that you wanted to spend time with. In part, she reminded me of my Sephardic grandmother, who was hired at a different school in a kind of a similar way to the way Fermi came here, and then gave over 45 years of her life to the students and teachers there. She got her job because the French teacher at the school ran away with the nurse, which is a different story. And she was the only person who spoke French for about 100 miles. So she ended up, she ended up teaching. Um, what I know here is that when Fermi started to teach, she soon became the standard against which all teachers were to be measured. I picked that up right away, even as the new kid on the block. There was Fermi, there was Doris, and then there was everyone else. <laughs> the first time I encountered her was in a ninth grade section where the entire class was sitting on the floor in front of their chairs with the lights out, which is what drew my attention in the first place and thought, well, I better go in and see what's happening. <laughs> I walked in and of course no one paid any attention to me because there was Fermi reading to them and they were riveted. They didn't notice me come in, they didn't notice me sitting there, they didn't notice me when I left. Of course, Fermi would not sit on the floor and said that, but she took great pleasure in the fact that the class kept trying to convince her to do that. <laughs> but it was the same way that she took pleasure sitting face to face, one on one, discussing Russian literature, or assigning her class to write about which piece of art they would steal if they ever went to the Metropolitan. <laughs> it scandalized the class and she was very pleased about that. Uh, but they wrote papers that were so brilliant that she brought five of them for me to read. One of them I still have, actually, and it was written by the same Lauren Urban, who we heard about a couple times. In that first year when I was here, I knew that the news of Doris's retirement had sent shockwaves through the faculty, mostly of sadness, and I became fearful that once one member of the team retired, the other was not far behind. This movie to Massachusetts seemed a little contagious. I had seen the famous photos of the two of them. I knew about the American studies. I had seen the DE news. And I knew that I somehow had to make sure that Fermi stayed. So I geared myself for the conversation when she was going to come in to talk about the number of years she had left. We negotiated through, and was felt, I felt very lucky to get five. At the time, I had no idea what they would be, how wonderful they would be. Yes, for her students and for colleagues, but also for me. It turned out that she had a granddaughter named Isabel, the same age as my daughter Isabel. And we spoke with each other regularly on their progress, as there were some striking similarities. They might have become friends had they actually known each other. And I think in Frimmy's mind and mine, they actually already were. <laughs> she spoke joyously about her Isabel, as I did mine. And she taught me a lot about raising girls. But there were a couple of things I didn't really understand about her, although today it has helped. She did describe for me a nightmare she had once that she had to take one Rilke poem out of a ninth grade unit, and she couldn't decide which one it would be. <laughs> because there was the perfect set of books, the perfect set of authors that you had to read while you were at Dwight Englewood. But for the life of me, I couldn't understand what the big deal about this was over one poem. 
she was not pleased by my lack of understanding, or really my sympathy for this story, and in her own way she set out to set me straight. Eventually she won, but not in any conventional way. She went and found a poem that turned my love of growing tomatoes, which for me is about dirt and trowels and automated watering system, but she found a poem that turned it into an English class. She brought the poem and we sat and studied what it meant and how I could relate it to my playing in the dirt. She later gave me a volume of signs and nature poetry when she retired. And when my father died, she found the perfect poem for me, the poetry neophyte, which I ended up actually reading his funeral. In her own sweet way, she was relentless, and I was grateful. And even at the end of her career, Frimery was the most up-to-date teacher I knew, and yet she represented the truest old-fashioned sense of what remains the art of the profession. She found kids where they were, and she took them somewhere else, through her own love for her subject and her love for her students. She believed in every student and enjoyed each one as much as they enjoyed her. And she was also the one who always kept reading, kept learning, kept reaching to know more and to experience more. She pushed herself in even the most wonderful ways, torturing herself in the best sense in her pursuit of excellence at the piano. She wanted everyone to have the joy that she had about reading, about following your passions, about engagement with the world. There was no better model for students or for her colleagues, and I can only assume for her family. And that's what I'll remember most, the kind and generous, gentle spirit that guided, inspired, and motivated. She was a true teacher in every sense of the world, world and this school was blessed many times over for by her presence in our classrooms. Of course, we'll miss her terribly, but as, as the same as I'll say to the graduating class tomorrow about their time here, Frimmy Spirit will live on, and every time I walk by the room that bears her name, I can touch the sign and recall that spirit. Hers was a great life, and Dwight Englewood a great benefactor. Long live Frimmy Spirit. We, we had promised a, a moment here where we might uh, ask anybody who just wanted to say a few words to, uh, to have that opportunity to say a few words. So would anybody like to, please? I'm going to start here with Abby up front. You want to use this? Okay. When I came here for almost 40 years ago, the first person to reach out to me, very justifiably insecure person. The first person to reach out to me was Privy Sagan. We spoke for a long while that first time on the window seat in Host House. And you didn't have to speak with Privy for more than five minutes in order to realize, in order to be aware of her gentleness, her extreme kindness, her wisdom, and her mind so full of wondrous things that there was no room in there for ego, or pettiness, or negativity. That first of many shared conversations was my introduction to Dwight Englewood School. And it left me with one thought resounding in my head uh, that I, I realized is a quote that in its original context was meant to be ironic. But there's no irony in it for me when applied to Dwight Englewood and to Primmy. And that was Oh, brave the world that has such people in it. Wow. I shared a similar experience as my former colleague Joan did when I was interviewing Spanish Inquisition? Is that what you call it? Maybe it was the Russian Inquisition. Anyway, I was terrified, and with all due respect to some of my colleagues who are still here, Frimi saved the day. Um, that year, I was 37 years old, just moving from California, which was never my home. And it's almost like Frimi knew right away that Providence Town really was my home. I also knew at the time that the school wanted to hire my husband, Dennis, 
as a science teacher, but we had made it clear it was a twofer. So I had the dubious honor that first year at Wright of quote unquote filling in for Nancy Meltzer and Frimmy. Needless to say, thank goodness for me, I survived, but I never would have even uh, dared to presume I could fill in for either of them. I had to make my own way. Eventually, I found myself in the faculty study, but I must have been like the reception secretary because my desk was right in front of Frimmy's. And the list of kids looking for her was out the door and down around and towards the um, administrative area. And I always had to know where Frimmy was because if she wasn't there, I was supposed to know it. <laughs> um, I don't want to go on too long because I'm going to start crying. But Frimmy was an amazing teacher, both for her colleagues and for certain children. Uh, my youngest um, really benefited in ways immeasurably in Frimmy's class. And Frimmy did something that might be considered a little um, not out of the normal order, but after Julia graduated from Dwight and went on her own way, Frimmy shared the letter of recommendation that she had written for Julia. And I'm sorry she broke rules. I'm glad somewhere in my messy house I still have that letter. Um, I've been, I already miss Brittany. But don't forget that she loved Martha's Vineyard, and that was another thing that we shared, was the um, bits of Massachusetts. And um, I just want to say thank you for everybody being here and for stealing all the things that I would have wanted to say about her in the first place. I, I just want to add one thing. I, I, um, I consider myself a student of uh, Fermi Sagan. And by that I mean um, I refer to the reading group, which was referenced a few times in here, but uh, it was such an important and uh, formative experience for me, and always will be. And uh, I learned so much in that group from quite a few people that are in this room, but for me was the moderator. She moderated, and I mean that in the original sense of the word. It was wonderful. And I think Joan referenced her angelic smile, and that's what I remember about her. I, I bet she came into the world with it. It is my sincerest hope that she went out of this world uh, with that smile, but it's what I will always remember about her. I wrote this long thing, and I could make it very short because a lot of people have done it. But I once asked Frémy Stegen, I said, listen, Frémy, I want you to put on a leather jacket, I want you to go back on Harley Davidson. And she said, sure. And she did. Later, I said, I need you to dress up as a soccer coach and pretend to be Chris Schmidt. And she said, okay, where I go? <laughs> but I, I also, Frimmy and I used to get together and talk about music. And well, the truth is, she would talk and I would listen, which was fine because she knew so much more about it. But once we were talking, I said, listen, I just started talking about uh, listening to Puccini. And she said, oh, Puccini. Eli had, we were driving in the car and Eli had to pull over to the side of the road because the music was so beautiful. And that's the passion she had. And another time she said, I passed her in the hallway and she goes, so, what are you listening to? And I said, you know, I just listened to one of the Mozart horn concertos on the way out to school and I gotta say, I don't like it at all, I had to turn it off. And she gave me this look. <laughs> this looked like I was this ninth grader that didn't bother to do the reading. <laughs> and she said, I don't panic. <laughs> Mozart had bad days just like everybody else. Now go home and listen to him again on the piano chairs. So I did. And I just got one more. Last one. Well, I, was, I bought this CD by the violinist Hilary Hahn. And uh, I loved it. And I was trying to get Fermi to listen to it. So we went to her house. And she listened and she nodded. 
And at the end, I remember the soul, she goes, you are so lucky. You are so lucky that you love this music. Think of what you'd be missing if you didn't. <laughs> and you know what? I am lucky, incredibly lucky. And everyone in this room is lucky to have known such a kind, wise, and beautiful woman. I first got to know Frimi, uh, tra not translating, reading Rilke. John Grumman, Frimi, and I went up into a tiny office somewhere, somewhere in the school, and we spent uh, a couple of months reading the Duino elegies. Um, after that, um, I was one of the initial members of the reading group. I think Frimi thought the reading group grew out of our Rilke reading, and uh, that went on for really 30 years. Uh, we did have a satellite with Armand and Becky where we translated Latin. Aris uh, Fermi said that um, I was called the translator. Eli called me the translator because I started translating it. Horace was always first in the class. I mean, uh, Ar Armand was always first in the class. Uh, but Fermi was the reader with the great sensibility. And I think that's always been true. Um, <clears throat> she meant an enormous amount to me. And recently, I wrote this very short poem, you'll be glad to know, uh, with her in mind. It's called Dialogue with Illusions, because we had a lot of illusions together. The first speaker is for me. The first eight lines, the first 10 lines, I cannot do her voice. And then the last speaker is me. And the last illusion is to the Duino elegies. <clears throat> this is for me. I take no joy from darkness, nor relish the grotesque. Rage and horror, yes, but depravity is dissipation's page. An alchemist who hustles hatred into spectacle, diverting from the wellspring, as if the evil lurked in ornaments, not the heart. Shameless, perfectly shameless. Although I do acknowledge the allure as if death were the mother of beauty, and she <coughs> could bring fulfillment to our dreams. You know, I, I've relished darkness, found joy in the grotesque, indulged myself in ways I won't confess. You shudder, not from shock, but greater expectations. You dispel the streak of malice Schadenfreude demands. Dante's lapsed heretics do not deserve their ring of fire, their unending pain. Unbearable beauty we too embraced, though our indifferent angels disdained to case us in their terrifying wings. She's the best. I think we'll do one more. We will put. First, a short poem that epitomizes the spirit of Frimi. And secondly, a, I hope, short letter from my wife Carol, who could not be here. The poem. Title. Matina, mi lumino dimenso. Translation, think of the row at dawn, ever blowing. And here's a letter from Carol, uh, in case there's someone who doesn't know, longtime art history teacher. Uh, as I was reading over the letter, I realized that I must work through Rilke. I <laughs> there's a constant, but no surprises. Dear Primi, I will never forget our reading of art historical criticism or our collaborating on ekphrasis, where you not only taught me what that word meant, but also brought in wonderful poems that we could pair up 
with works of art that I chose. I have and will always be guided by Rilke's injunction, you must change your life. The last line of his poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo. A line we talked about endlessly. Our discussions about the meaning of art to us have become a bedrock of my identity. But beyond the intellectual, you were always and will continue to be mother profundus. No matter what bothered me, you were there with wisdom and comfort. You took such interest in my well-being. You got me through two very tough funerals. And so I say farewell to you, stronger for your counsel on how to say goodbye with sorrow, joy, and love. Thank, thank you all for coming. I know not everybody's going to be able to say something. There is a reception afterwards that I hope that you'll all attend and you'll talk. You'll talk. I hope some of you will go down and, as Joe says, and he says it to me often, touch the the, the Sagan room uh, plaque outside of her room. Uh, and it is selfish of because we like to say the Sagan room. Um, if I could say one thing just to end, is I listen to so many people say so many wonderful things. In today's world, with all that is around us, it's amazing a person that could be this kind could have changed the world so much. Thank you for me.